four o'clock, we're going to get started. Um, welcome, everybody, to another installation of the Crow Canyon webinar series. Thank you all for joining us on this beautiful Thursday afternoon. Um, today, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Michelle Turner on the archaeology of the Aztec North Great House. Um, but first, I want to do a few little preliminary task keeping things that we always have to do. First, I really want to thank once again Dylan Schwent, our director of IT, and Taylor Hasbrook, who's been organizing all of these um, webinars. Thank you for making this possible. And thanks to all of you. We wouldn't be doing it if we didn't have um, a really great audience every single week for these. Um, so we really miss you down at Crow Canyon. Um, and, we, uh, and we hope to see you again. But in the meantime, we're really glad that, um, that people are enjoying these webinars. And there's just been some great content. Um, for those of you who might be joining us for the first time, I just want to walk you through Zoom video conferencing and some of the tools that we're going to be using during this webinar. First, um, you'll see floating talking heads if you're on the Zoom video conference of myself right now and Michelle, and they might get in your way. So you can click on that window and move it out of your way or even minimize it if you need. There's a little um, thin rectangle and that will hide the talking heads. So if Michelle is showing something that um, that is being blocked by the talking heads, just move her out of the way. Um, we will be taking questions during this talk, but we're gonna reserve them to the end. You can ask them whenever though. The way that you do that is uh, we want you to ask it with the Q&A button. If you're on a laptop or a desktop and you wiggle your mouse, it'll be in the menu bar that appears at the bottom of your screen. It's the little Q&A. Um, if you're on your phone, you, it might have cleared. All you have to do is tap your screen and then the Q&A button should appear at the bottom of your screen. If you're joining us through Facebook, go ahead and ask questions in the chat and we'll get to them. I'll be sort of organizing those questions throughout Michelle's talk. If there's a short, easy question that I happen to know the answer to, I might just, just pound out an answer to you, but otherwise um, we'll be reserving them to the end. If you're having difficulties with the Zoom, go over and check us out on Facebook, facebook.com slash Crow Canyon Archaeological Center. And you can always subscribe to us on YouTube and watch all of the recorded webinars there after the fact. So if your internet's screwing up or if you've got to run, um, join us later on YouTube. We should post it this evening. I want to introduce you to Crow Canyon. If you've never been down and joined us, our mission at Crow is to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. And one way that we've been doing that lately has been through our ongoing excavations, our archeological research project um, in the Lakeview community. Michelle is actually our first, our inaugural um, postdoctoral scholar at the Crow Canyon Archeological Center. And she's working on a lot of the pottery um, from the Wallace Great House. Our upcoming webinars, we've got a, a few. Um, on next week, on July 2nd, um, we've got the Archaeology of Food and Social Transformation with Dr. Sarah Ois. Um, on Thursday, July 16th, we've got Historic Influences in Contemporary Pueblo Pottery with Charles King. And I was just told that we actually have one um, in between those two. I, I guess it'd be, what, Thursday, gosh, the 9th. Um, and that's going to be Ben Bellarado. We don't have a title from him yet, but my guess it's going to be on his incredible dissertation. Um, so um, please tune in for that. All right, now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Michelle Turner. Um, Michelle got her doctorate from Binghamton University in 2019. Uh, she also holds a JD, a law degree from Vanderbilt University Law School from 2000. And Michelle is, as I said, Crow Canyon's inaugural postdoctoral scholar. We're really excited that Michelle has been able to join us over the last year. Um, her research focuses on the analysis of Puebloan community or material culture in northern New Mexico and southwestern Colorado. Her dissertation research, which we'll be hearing about today, was funded by the National Science Foundation and involved excavation at Aztec North, a great house at Aztec Ruins National Monument. 
Um, and she did this in collaboration with archaeologists and researchers at um, Aztec Ruins National Monument, uh, among others. She also did analysis of architecture and artifacts there. Um, and she's in the process of publishing the results of that research, which is really exciting and we get a preview of today. Michelle is a ceramic an analyst, and as part of the Northern Chaco Outliers Project, she's working with Crow Canyon staff and participants to analyze thousands of pottery sherds from Wallace Great House and surrounding communities in the Lakeview Group. Michelle's work seeks to connect the scientific study of ancient pottery to questions of social identity, style, communities of practice, and human thing entanglement. And in addition to that research, we're doing some fun work together right now on women's roles over the centuries in developing maize diversity in maize agriculture. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Michelle Turner. And Michelle, take it away. Thank you, Kyle. I will stop my screen. There we go. I will share my screen. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Kyle, for that introduction um, and for the opportunity to do this webinar. This was supposed to be a live talk uh, down at the local church um, <laughs> with maybe 50 or 60 people in attendance. So this is going to be a little bit different for me. Uh, I kind of feel like I'm talking into the ether here, but I will do my best to make it entertaining for the ether. And hopefully there's actually someone listening. Um, so thank you. Yes, this is my dissertation research uh, about Aztec North. And uh, let me jump right in here. OK, so the, the site we're talking about uh, is at Aztec Ruins National Monument, which is part of the National Park Service. It's in northern New Mexico. I'll show you a map in a minute. Um, and it was occupied um, around those dates, 1100 to 1275. Um, that early end of the date range is one of my research questions, so you'll hear a lot more about that. Um, and then the 1275, the whole region, uh, people basically left and migrated off to other parts of the Southwest uh, around that time. And so Aztec uh, continued throughout that whole time period. Um, Big thing that I need to say right up front, because I know not everybody uh, in this audience necessarily knows all of this, but this has nothing to do with Aztecs in Mexico. Uh, this site was named by Anglo and um, settlers in the 19th century. I don't know. It's a little hard to tell if they actually thought that it was built by Aztecs, didn't think local people could have built this, or if they were just kind of um, capitalizing on the interest in Aztecs at that particular moment. Uh, but either way, um, this had nothing to do with Aztecs. The people who built this were ancestral Puebloans, um, the um, ancestors of modern Pueblo people, which gives me a really good segue because I really want to acknowledge um, that we are talking about ancestral lands. I'm here in Cortez, Colorado, in my office at Crow Canyon, um, and I want to acknowledge that here I am on the ancestral lands and territories of the uh, Hopi, Zuni, Pueblo, Ute, Apache, and Diné people. And many of those people are also have ancestral connections to people who lived at Aztec ruins, which I'm going to be talking about today. So I want to acknowledge that. Um, I'm also going to try really hard to avoid that word ruins because I know that a lot of indigenous folks really object to that word um, because they think these are still living places uh, of their ancestors. Um, but it's in the name of the park, so it's a little hard for me to always avoid it, but I'll try. All right. So. Um, this is Aztec, uh, but our story actually begins elsewhere. Well, I should probably introduce the project first. So um, this was a project we did in 2016. Uh, I was a graduate student at Binghamton University working with Dr. Ruth Van Dyke, uh, and we um, got permission to do this very limited uh, research at Aztec North, which had previously not been excavated. Uh, we were very fortunate to get that, um, and, and we, we appreciated it um, and, and, you know, are trying to do right by the site. Uh, so um, the crew was all volunteers, mostly uh, grad students from Binghamton, plus a few other people. And uh, I have a picture there of the whole crew, plus our uh, friends at Aztec who were right there with us and supported us so much. And we're so grateful to them. Um, okay. 
So our story begins uh, actually at Chaco Canyon, uh, which is a little bit south of Aztec ruins, and I'll, I'll show you um, a map in a minute. Um, Chaco Canyon was the big political center um, in this time period. It started, it got going around 850 uh, AD. And then our last cutting date, sort of the end of construction, uh, is 1140-ish. So that's, that's the time period for Chaco Canyon. Um, I'm not going to pretend that I fully understand Chaco Canyon. People have been working on it for a long time, but um, I'll, I'll present some views about it. So Chaco is characterized by what we call great houses. There are a dozen of them at Chaco. Um, they're beautiful and they're huge. Uh, they are what we call monumental architecture. And this is very different from what had been in this region before. It was generally pretty small um, unit pueblos, houses, um, farming communities, and then fairly uh, suddenly we shift to this monumental architecture at Chaco Canyon. So this is Pueblo Benito that I'm showing here. Um, Pueblo Benito has, uh, I think, four stories, maybe maybe even five in some places. Uh, it's really tall um, and um, yeah, monumental, 400, uh, sorry, more than hundreds of rooms. Um, Within Pueblo Bonito, there's also a number of burials that don't look like anything else that we see elsewhere in the Southwest. They have a lot of grave goods and a lot of uh, prestige goods, things like turquoise, things like shell from the Pacific Ocean, uh, copper bells from Mexico. Um, so these are special people in some way. We also have lots of evidence of ritual activity, ritual objects, sacred objects. Uh, so uh, many archaeologists see this as a place where something different happened, where there was some kind of social hierarchy, a political center that developed, and in a place where you wouldn't necessarily expect it. It's a really dry, remote canyon. Uh, there's a lot of research going on about how many people could have could have lived there based on the agriculture in that area. Um, I'm not going to get into all those details, but just so everyone knows, this is, this is what Chaco is, and this is what Great House is. So a little more detail on great houses. So we have uh, a few characteristics I want to talk about. Uh, the masonry, it's beautiful. It's not always as beautiful as what I'm showing you there. It, it varies from place to place and from time to time. Um, but we have this gorgeous uh, masonry, really highly sort of worked, really overdone because actually the we think that the outside of most of these great houses was plastered over in white. So you wouldn't actually even have seen <laughs> masonry. So um, really beautiful uh, architecture. Um, we have the wooden beams. So there really aren't a lot of trees in the Chaco Canyon area. So we know that these wooden beams were carried from the Chisca Mountains, which is like, um, I wanna say 70 miles away, a good distance away. So those were carried in. And I believe there were something like 200,000 of those beams that were carried into Chaco Canyon to build these great houses. Uh, luckily for us, because we can use those for tree ring dating. Um, the other thing on the right, I have a picture of, of what we call core and veneer architecture. This is actually a picture of Haiti ruins, if anyone has worked there. Um, so core and veneer, the veneer is what you see on the left, that beautiful worked sandstone. Um, and there's a veneer on both sides of the wall, thick walls. And then the center has uh, what we call core, which is stone rubble. Um, in this case, it's pretty nicely laid. Other times it's, it's messier, but that's what the core is. Um, and ar archaeologists have sometimes called this a uh, low visibility feature. Um, the idea is, unless you saw that being constructed, you wouldn't know what was in the center of those walls. Just looking at that wall at Pueblo Bonito, um, once it's finished, you wouldn't know what was in the middle. So a little bit of a hidden feature. Um, possibly that means that you can keep it a secret. OK, so moving back up to Aztec ruins, uh, here's a map. This is uh, up in the left hand corner is the four corners. So you're looking mostly at New Mexico, uh, Colorado, and then Utah and Arizona over there. 
Um, the region where Aztec is uh, has been called the Middle San Juan. I like the word Tota, which is a Navajo word, actually, and it means something like rivers coming together. And I like it because it gives you a sense of what this region is like. There are three rivers that come together there. Uh, the San Juan River, the La Plata, and the Animas River all come together near Farmington, and Aztec is just a little bit over to the east. Aztec is also due north of Chaco Canyon. Uh, Chaco Canyon's a little bit down, if you see that. It's about uh, 60 miles away. Um, the fact that it's due north, um, for those of you who have read Steve Lexon's Chaco Meridian, that might be significant, and um, I'll probably end up talking about that a little bit later on, too. Uh, okay, so that gives you a sense of where we are. I wanted to share this name. Uh, this is uh, Zia Pueblo's name for Aztec. Um, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but what it means is the place where cattails grow. And I think that just that really does give you a sense of this place. Uh, people are coming here because of the river. They're building on a river. Uh, in stark contrast to Chaco Canyon, where there's a wash that comes through, but it's not a permanent year-round river. So this is the Animas River. It comes down from uh, southwest Colorado, and it is fed by mountain snow. So it is a permanent river, and uh, in many years there's a lot of water. So that's probably part of why they're there. Um, these were farmers, I guess I should say that, in case we have people uh, who don't know a lot about the ancestral Puebloans. Uh, they were farming um, maize mostly, but also other crops. Um, there is the possibility that there were irrigation canals. We actually don't know this for sure, but early uh, Anglo settlers wrote about seeing prehistoric canals at this place. They've kind of been erased by 150 years of agriculture uh, at Aztec since then, but it seems like there might have been some basic irrigation canals. Um, just a quick shot of the Animus River. This was a good year, 2019, lots of water. But I do want to point out that not every year is like that. Uh, 2018, the year before that, uh, there was there was still water, but it was, it was low. So I guess the point I want to make is even if you have um, – even if you're on the river, that doesn't necessarily uh, insulate you from droughts like we know happened in this area during this time period. Um, and especially if you have an irrigation canal somewhere along that bank, um, there's going to come a point where the river's too low to actually. Okay, so Aztec West. Um, if you've ever visited Aztec, this is probably the great house that you saw. You can walk through it. We still have original uh, ceilings. It's, it's incredible. And it is sort of the epitome of a Chacoan outlier great house. 400 rooms, at least three stories tall, has that beautiful masonry. Uh, again, it varies. Parts of it are, are a lot more Chacoan looking than other parts. Um, but we have really good evidence that, that this was built with the participation in some way of Chacoan builders. It has the cord veneer walls. It also has another feature that we would call a low visibility feature, which are footer trenches, and I'll show a picture of that later on. Um, so this was a really important uh, technological advance that we think came out of Chaco. Um, so they would, they would dig a trench as a foundation, fill it with uh, huge rocks and mortar, let that harden, and then they would build the walls on top of that. And that's actually a really important uh, technological um, innovation that allowed them to go high, to build multiple stories high, um, and to support those really thick core and veneer walls. Okay, so that's another low visibility feature. Again, you, would, you wouldn't have been able to see those once the building was finished. So unless you were there during construction, you wouldn't know about it. Um, Aztec West also has all kinds of amazing Chaco and artifacts. And if you haven't visited there, I know they're I think they're still closed right now, but um, it's an amazing place to visit and they have a great little museum to see there. Um, okay, so Chaco and artifacts. So a Chaco and great house at Aztec West. I guess I should mention that uh, the green banding, that band of green stone at Aztec West, uh, really interesting feature of it. Aztec West was, um, excavated, um, you know, most of it was excavated. And that happened in the early 20th century. Earl Morris uh, did those excavations for the American Museum of Natural History. Um, 
and I always want to give a shout out to his wife, Ann Axtell Morris, who was right there with him uh, in, in archaeology all over the Southwest and in Mexico. Um, so they did a really large scale excavation. That's why you can visit this whole site and walk through there. Um, okay, so that's Aztec West, and here's a picture of Aztec West. But Aztec West is just one of three great houses. <clears throat> so I'm showing you a picture here of Aztec West. There's another one called Aztec East that is off to the right of this picture uh, somewhere. And then our site that we're going to be talking about today, Aztec North, is up on this river terrace uh, somewhere behind those cottonwood trees. Um, so we have uh, Aztec North that's up on, on top of the terrace and then these other two sites that are down in the valley below. And that's a really characteristic sort of Chaco and outlier feature that, that they use the high place as well as the low places. So this is a map I made uh, to sort of lay out the cultural landscape, of the whole, whole landscape of this uh, place. So um, the Animus River is the blue down on the right. And then you see Aztec West and Aztec East are, are near there. There's... Um, these sort of symmetrically laid out small sites, tri walls and mounds and things. And then there's a road that starts right in the center between Aztec West and Aztec East and goes up the topo lines or the, the terrace. So it goes up the hill, straight up the hill to Aztec North. Aztec North is sort of the apex of this triangle, right? Um, Want to also point out that little site that's labeled as LA 60,020. It's two little buildings that are on either side of the road. Um, when you're at Aztec West or Aztec East, you can't actually see Aztec North and vice versa. So the high place and the low place can't see each other directly. So I, I think that uh, that little site on the road is actually showing you which way is the proper approach to go up to Aztec North. So other archaeologists, including uh, Ruth Van Dyke, my PhD advisor, have noticed that Aztec basically reproduces the Chacolan landscape. It seems to be very intentionally doing that. So on the left, you have a uh, sort of center, you know, downtown Chaco uh, with Pueblo Benito, Chetra Kettle down in the, in the canyon. And then Pueblo Alto is up on top of the mesa with the road going up the middle. Notice where Chaco Wash is. And then over on the right, you have Aztec, where they seem to be sort of doing the same thing, reproducing that triangle with the road in the middle with the river. Um, it does shift direction, um, and that's maybe a thing to talk about uh, later on. Um, but it seems like a really intentional effort to, to reproduce the landscape, and maybe this was very intentionally the second Chaco Canyon. Um, this is just a, this is the parks map of Aztec, of Aztec North. Um, the gray D-shaped thing in the center is Aztec North is the actual great house and then everything around it is part of, of the greater site. Um, the D-shape, of course, is sort of very typically Chacoan and so is the size. It's a little hard for me to convey the size of this place, but it was, it was big. Um, I think the estimate was about 100 rooms. Um, if it was anywhere other than Aztec, it would be the biggest thing around. Uh, it, it is smaller than Aztec West, but, but it's, a, it's a big great house. So the size of it, the location of it on the top of the terrace, all of that is pointing towards, you know, the chocolate influence. But there are weird things about it. So this is an image of what Aztec West looked like before it was excavated. Like you couldn't miss it. There was obviously a building there. There was all this standing masonry. Um, if you go to a site that hasn't been excavated, a Chacoan site that hasn't been excavated, uh, even today, you'll see sandstone lying around. It'll be pretty obvious that that there was masonry there. At Aztec North, uh, the, there's an image from the year before we started. You really, you really don't see that. We don't have a little bit of sandstone around, but not much. Um, and there were certainly not standing walls that way. Uh, it was more of just a mound. It's really hard to even see it in this picture. But as you're walking, you can clearly see that there's a mound there and there are artifact scatters. So we knew that there was a, a big site there. Um, but the, the expectation going into this and what other archaeologists had, uh, had 
guest we would find is adobe so the idea is that, that it was an adobe structure kind of melted and so you end up with this mound that doesn't really have the sandstone so that's that was really the expectation going in and that's really weird for a site that otherwise looks very much chaco in, in terms of size and shape and location okay so going into the research uh, we had four sort of big research questions and i'm going to structure my talk around these research questions and go through them one by one but quick introduction big question is site chronology when does aztec north get built how does that relate to when aztec west gets built which one comes first um, second question construction methods was it really this weird adobe thing or was it something else uh, relations with Chaco Canyon, with other regions, I think it's become apparent already that Aztec West has deep relations to Chaco Canyon, but if Aztec North comes earlier, did it already have that? How did that work? And then other regions, right? Um, question four, daily life and subsistence. Earl Morris did an amazing archaeology uh, excavation at Aztec West, but he... Uh, you know, at that time, he didn't have all of the tools that we have now. And, you know, so maybe he wasn't as interested in questions about, you know, what women did at sites and what children did or what people ate. Those, those weren't necessarily his big research questions. So, uh, and he didn't have the methods that we have now to collect tiny seeds from soil samples. So I wanted to make sure that we really did that because we just don't have that kind of data from Aztec. Um, so this is our research design, I guess. Uh, it's, it's an image, an approximation of where our study units were. So we had two big study units in the Great House itself. Uh, study unit one up at the top uh, was basically looking for the back wall because it was melted, this mound, we didn't exactly know where to find the wall. And of course, we wanted to see the back wall um, to see the architecture of it. Um, we were also, you know, part of the Park Service's interest in this was that they were talking about building a trail to go up to Aztec North, uh, and they needed to know exactly where the back is to build that trail. Study Unit 2 was off in the east wing of it, um, and the goal there, there, there had been some disturbance, maybe a little bit of pot hunting there, so part of it was to evaluate that, but also just to see the architecture in that part of the Great House. Our other two study units were down in the middens, the middens of the trash heaps at the site were pretty deflated. There was not a lot there. Um, I think that's partly that it wasn't occupied that long or that intensively. It may also be that things are sort of sliding down uh, the terrace. Um, but those ended up not being very deep. But, you know, trash heaps are a really good place to look for things like food um, remains to find out what people were eating and what people were doing and throwing away. Okay, so our first question, site chronology. Our hope, of course, was to find some of those big beams. And um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Southwest, uh, tree ring dating is where it's at here in the Southwest. You can date a site to the year that it was built, often based on, on um, when the tree was cut. Um, we did not find any wooden beams, unfortunately. Um, so, uh, and I guess I should have mentioned that our site, our, our dig was really small. Our, trend, our two big trenches were one meter wide. And then I think one was six meters long and the other was eight meters long. So we're, we're not talking about huge portions of the Great House. So it was always unlikely that we would find one of those beams, but we didn't. Uh, but what we did find is a lot of corn and uh, wood, charcoal, uh, which can be radiocarbon dated. So that is, that is what we did. Um, so uh, generally at Aztec, in the past, and this is still true, we, we don't have anything before um, this time period. Um, we don't have any basket maker or P1 evidence right there at Aztec anyway. Um, so the absolutely earliest evidence from Aztec is from 10, sorry, before our research, the absolute earliest evidence of construction was about 1090. They started cutting um, wood for Aztec West. It may have sat for quite some time before they actually started building. Um, and then we have the end of Aztec uh, in the late 13th century when, when everyone in the whole region migrates away. Uh, 
construction on Aztec West really got going at 1110, and we have lots of tree ring dates for that from previous people's research at Aztec West. Um, so that's that's a really pretty clear date, 1110, um, with a little bit of activity before that. But uh, so our, our big question at Aztec North is, was it built before Aztec West, just after Aztec West, sort of at the same time as Aztec West? We just didn't know. And just to fill out the timeline for you a little more, Aztec West was done around 1120, and then they shifted to Aztec East and started building it right away. Um, at Chaco, uh, there's, there's a drought in this time period, um, and Chaco sort of goes into decline in this time period as Aztec West and Aztec East are, are being constructed. Um, the last cutting date from Chaco, I believe, is about 1140, and Aztec, Aztec kind of founders at this point. Um, but at Aztec, things keep going. Uh, they keep building Aztec East well into the 13th century. Um, and it's not the same kind of construction. They're using local wood instead of bringing in those beams from great distances. It changes, but it keeps going. So we have occupation at Aztec, we think, for that whole time period. And then where does Aztec North fit in? Uh, people before had suggested the possibility that either it's really before Aztec West, or maybe, maybe just after Aztec West. Uh, Steve Lexon had floated the possibility that it's at the end of the occupation, that they're experimenting with this new adobe construction, which he thinks that they then took with them to Pacame, the next stop on the Chaco Meridian. Uh, so that that is, that is the big question that we were trying to figure out as far as chronology. Okay, so again, we didn't find the, the beams, but we do have things that can be radiocarbon dated, including the corn cobs. Uh, on the left, that's actually a piece of corn stalk that we found inside a piece of adobe, um, which is fun because then you're actually uh, dating the actual construction. Uh, the picture at the bottom is me collecting a little corn cob. And uh, just to go through the radiocarbon dating, I don't want to dwell on this too much, but that's sort of our results. Uh, that chart at the bottom has uh, the calibrated dates. So the 1000 to 1200, we knew that was sort of the period we were talking about. Um, and the radiocarbon date, what it did really give us is a clear occupation sometime between 1025 and 1155. Um, they all lined up, which is good. Uh, that doesn't answer any of the questions that we have about that uh, 1110 uh, date for Aztec West. It really doesn't resolve the question. I did do some Bayesian analysis, some statistical modeling, and that brought, it seemed like the probability came closer to 1100 at that point. Still doesn't totally answer the question. So, so the radiocarbon dating, um, you know, gave us data, but it's still a really wide time range. So the, in addition to the radiocarbon dating, I used another method of using ceramics. Uh, I won't dwell on this too much either, uh, mean ceramic dating. So I analyzed all of the pottery shirts that we got out of Aztec North. And, um, you know, we were able to type a lot of the pottery shirts. And we know the date ranges for most of this pottery really well based on 100 years of research and all of those tree ring dates that we have from other sites. So, for example, you know, with Gallup, uh, black on white, we have a really good idea of, of the date range when they started making this, when, when they stopped making this. So using those dates, uh, this is sort of a quantitative method to figure out when was an, an, a mean date for the occupation of the site. And the answer was 1101 plus or minus 38 years. That 1101 still doesn't answer a question, but also, uh, you know, 1101, you can't. It's not like that was the year that it was built. That was a mean date of occupy of the whole occupation, the whole pottery um, assemblage. So that's narrower than what we had before, but it doesn't doesn't quite answer the question. Uh, also, there was no San San Juan Redwares, which is something we would expect uh, if it was before 1070. So uh, we think it was after 10 after 1070. So occupation sometime between 1070 and 1139. So the radiocarbon dates gave us a really wide range. The ceramic dates actually did better, gave us a narrower range. 
still doesn't quite answer the question. Do you have one more line of evidence, which is the architecture, um, which is another research question. So let's let's jump into that one. So again, at Aztec North, we just, uh, from the surface, there was not a lot of sandstone, not a lot of evidence of masonry. We were expecting adobe. Uh, you can see these river cobbles, uh, the, the, the terrace is just covered with these uh, river cobbles and we expected a mix of adobe and those river cobbles as, as the main architecture. And we started digging and um, it was really hard to see where the walls even were. It was really not coming together. Um, and so we were, you know, it felt like we were digging through adobe, honestly. But then we got sort of down into these trenches and, and we found coarse masonry and it was coarse masonry veneers. It's not beautiful Chaco masonry necessarily. There's not a lot of it. So maybe I shouldn't uh, make judgments about it, but uh, it's clearly coarse masonry, right? Stone that was laid in place um, in courses as a veneer. because so we found it on both sides of the wall. But the core, of the of the these core and veneer walls was not stone it was adobe so that's what this architecture was it was uh, masonry veneers with adobe cores on this wall it looks like it was basically just balls of mud they were dropping them in um, in between the veneers you know, maybe packing them down a little bit it was not turtlebacks it was not um, you know, not any any of the kind of Adobe architecture that we know from other places in the Southwest. It, it feels like just these cores that are packed in. There was another place where they sort of padded it into place, um, but that's that's the cores of Aztec North. We kept digging, went under the floors. The floors were beautiful Adobe floors, very clear. Uh, but when we went down under them, we actually found footer trenches. So these were. You can see here we've got two courses of these big round um, river cobbles set into a really hard mortar. And this was what was supporting these walls. Again, this is the kind of, arch uh, kind of um, architectural feature that you need in order to support a three-story wall. What we had was not three stories. Uh, at, at all the places we excavated, we believe that it was just one story. We know that it was just one story. So it seems like Aztec North was just one story. And we were, this is actually the back wall of the great house. Um, so, you know, if it was gonna be three stories, that's where it would have been. So one story structure supported by these crazy uh, footer trenches. And, you know, these walls were kind of just so ephemeral that we didn't even really know where they were until we actually reached these trenches and then it was super clear. So they have this, this chocolate architectural feature. Okay, so to summarize, we have some really chocolate looking features. The footer trenches, we have masonry, even if it's not that great. We have the idea of a core and veneer wall. They understand that, that it's veneers and then something in the middle, even if it's the wrong thing. Um, we have the size of the great house, this huge D-shaped structure up on a high place. We have this whole cultural landscape. Uh, all of those things point to Chaco, right? To Chacoan influence. The adobe cores are not Chacoan. They're not, they're, there's nothing like them. There is another great house that is that was built of adobe. Uh, it's called Bissani, uh, and it's near Chaco but it did not have the veneers that we have at Aztec North. So there's some kind of relationship between these two things, but um, the idea of you know, masonry veneers with adobe cores, that seems to be just Aztec North and, and nowhere else. So where I've ended up in trying to work with these things is that I, I really think these are people who had not built a great house before. I think that those Chacoan builders who were involved at Aztec West were not building this structure. Um, they're using um, a construction method that I guess is, is kind of familiar to them. Uh, Adobe was definitely the local vernacular, as Gary Brown has called it here in, in Aztec. Uh, so people are using a material that's really familiar to them, but they're using it in a pretty different way than what they've done in the past. But it does seem like they have some Chaco in knowledge, uh, and especially the footer trenches. Um, does that mean that they 
got some knowledge from Chaco and people? Does that mean that maybe somebody saw a great house being constructed and knew parts of how it's done and not other parts? Um, kind of hard to tell, uh, but it does seem like they have some Chaco and knowledge here. And the other implication of all this, I think, is that Aztec North must predate Aztec West. So at Aztec West at 1110, there's this construction going on. We know the Chacoans are involved in that because they've got the whole package. Uh, I think if Aztec North was contemporaneous or later, it would look more like Aztec West. So uh, I, I, just logically, I think it has to predate Aztec West. So where does that leave us? And now we've got construction between 1070 and 1110. Uh, Still a 40 year period, but um, that's a lot better than, than, than we had before without the tree ring dates that other places have. Occupation ends sometime by 1139. Overall, I think we'd all agree that the trash at the site was very minimal for what for a great house. Uh, the trash mounds were sort of deflated, but also in the rooms, there just wasn't that much. So I, I don't think that it was occupied for very long. We also did see uh, some evidence of sort of um, remodeling. So maybe, maybe it was falling down. It's possible this wasn't the most uh, successful architecture in the world. Okay, just a few words about thinking about adobe and masonry in the Chacoan world. Um, and I do think that archaeologists in the Chaco region, not in other places necessarily, but here we, we've tied, tended to equate masonry with all the other things that we think were going on in Chaco. Complexity, knowledge, astronomy, rituals, hierarchy. Um, and there is this idea that uh, what's going on at Chaco is elites who are mobilizing other people's labor, getting them to build these monumental structures. There's also, I think, a strong belief that men were the stonemasons, that most of the architecture, most of the construction at great houses was being done by men. Um, and when we think about adobe in the Chacoan world, we, we kind of think of it as, oh, the local stuff. Uh, it's expedient, it's egalitarian, it's boring, it's what you do, you know, with your family. It's not what you do when you're going out to build public architecture for the elites, right? Uh, technical difficulty here. Hey, Mich Michelle, yeah. if you just click your, click your presentation, it'll start working again, I think. Yep. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So all of this is sort of despite this long history of adobe use before, basket maker and, and uh, earlier structures often had a lot of adobe. Um, there was some adobe during the Chaco period and then after Chaco, uh, you know, what comes next in the Rio Grande and other places is adobe pueblos. Uh, this is Taos Pueblo, which is mostly adobe. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about Adobe and what this might mean about sort of labor regimes at this place. I do think this was an experiment. It's not like anything that we've seen anywhere else. Uh, I, I think they were just kind of trying something new. I also think that, that there was some kind of transition going on here. These are clearly people who are trying to build a Chaco and great house, trying to, to, emulate, I guess is the word, uh, trying to be part of that Chacoan world, but uh, don't quite have all the whole package yet. So some kind of transition going on. And the other thing about Adobe is it doesn't take skill. It doesn't take strong people. It doesn't take, you know, manly men going to the quarry and getting the, the stone and then cutting it into blocks. Um, what it does take is a lot of people, uh, many hands and feet to bring the water up, to mix the adobe, to lay it in place. And you would have had to lay it in place pretty quickly in order to get a roof on top of it before it starts raining. Um, so, you know, a family can build a house out of adobe very quickly and easily, but I, I think on this scale, 100 rooms, um, it, it would have taken a whole village, which suggests maybe this was more of an egalitarian labor regime, the adobe, uh, tells us that this whole village is coming together to build this thing. But at the same time, we do have the masonry too. And so maybe they're sort of um, turning towards or being influenced by this uh, Chacoan 
labor regime that we think of as, as more hierarchical with the masonry. And it, I, I love this picture uh, that portrays two women plastering at Jemez Pueblo. Um, at the Pueblos, historically, we know that women were definitely responsible for the plastering, for the, the, the annual plastering. Um, but there, it, there's also good evidence that, especially before the Spanish uh, conquest, women were house builders. That was, that was women's uh a job that women did. So uh, I think I think that this adobe at Aztec North um, gives us the opportunity of thinking about great house construction in a different way. Uh, women probably were involved. Children probably were involved. What you need is, is all those hands and feet. Elderly people could have been involved in this. So uh, it, it does suggest to be sort of everyone coming together to do this. And the other point is water. Uh, it would have taken an enormous amount of water to build a structure on this scale with all those uh, cores. So possibly they did it. I mean, you couldn't do it during the rainy season. Maybe you could do it when there's snow uh, before the rainy season begins, but probably they were bringing water up from the river to do this, uh, and, which just an enormous amount of water that would have been brought up. And it almost materializes what I've said about this being sort of a wet place, a special place that's because, that has all this water. Okay, so uh, relations with other regions. Um, I studied that mostly through the pottery. Um, in this region, we're really lucky that the temper in pottery uh, tells us very clearly where it came from. And like I said, pottery moved a lot within the Chacoan region. So I, I don't want to go through this too much, but we can tell uh, if it came from 60 miles away, or if we came from the other corner, 60 miles in the other direction, uh, we know where pottery came from, which is, um, which is a great gift here. And uh, I'm actually gonna stop sharing for a second because I have some props here for those of you who maybe don't know uh, what this pottery looked like. Kyle, are you seeing me now? Yes, we can see you, Michelle. Okay, I'm seeing a blank screen, but I wanted to just show some pottery. This is these are uh, reproductions, actually, that I I borrowed from our education department here. Um, this is what I'm talking about when I talk about grayware. This is a really small one, so uh, these are the cooking pots. They probably would have stored corn or other things in it in the grayware, and they would have. A lot of them are really huge, huge pots. Uh, it's corrugated grayware, so these are these were made in coils, and then they impressed every little one of these with fingers. We often find fingerprints on them, uh, so not something that was real expedient and made quickly. This was actually a lot of work. Um, so that's the grayware again, often really big pots, and those pots moved 60 miles. Uh, That's the grayware. And I also just wanted to show an example, again, a reproduction. I believe this was made by our own educator, Paul Ermajati, of a whiteware bowl. So the whiteware is painted, decorated, very beautiful often. Um, and that's what I mean by whiteware. Okay, to go back to my slide now. So when I analyzed all of the ceramics from Aztec North, this is what I got. Uh, the third line shows the local pottery and most of the pottery was locally made, which is what you did, which makes sense. You would want most of your pottery to be local. Um, but we also had a lot of imports. So of the grayware, those cooking pots, 19% of them came from the Chuska Mountains off to the west. Uh, I want to say it's at least 50, 50 miles. I'm, I'm not exactly sure about that, but it's not close. 19% of the grayware came from there. 26% of the whiteware came from the Cibola region, which is around Chaco Canyon and south of Chaco Canyon. So lots of imports. Lots of imported Chisca and Cibola pottery, which is kind of exactly what you would expect from an outlier of Chaco Canyon that's sort of fully engaged in the Chaco uh, 
region uh, in Chacoan networks. So whatever's going on with the architecture, um, the pottery actually seems very typical of a Chacoan outlier. So I think that Aztec North actually got quickly brought into the Chacoan patterns, you know, assuming it, it started out as something more local, um, their goal of becoming part of Chaco seems to have come true. Okay, um, chipped stone is another way of studying relations with other regions, but actually at Aztec North, most of the uh, lithics were local. The, these are our four projectile points. All of those were materials that you can find uh, really close by. They were Pueblo side notch projectile points. Um, and the local materials, for the most part, that's what we found. And most of them were pretty expedient kind of tools. We didn't find a lot of formal tools. Um, mostly, if they needed a tool, they would just knock open a, a, a local cobble or find some local chert and just make a really expedient sort of tool. The one exception was the obsidian. We had a lot of obsidian. Um, and we had it all sourced. It all came from the Jemez Mountains. Uh, and there's a map showing you where Aztec is in relation to the Jemez Mountains. And the sourcing of it is not that surprising, but the quantity of obsidian was really surprising. So we had 152 pieces, uh, and there, this is a chart sort of comparing it to other sites at Chaco Canyon for, for the whole century of 1020 to 1120. Um, in all the sites that have been excavated there, there were 196 pieces. So just the proportions are surprising, considering that we did four pretty small study units and that the site was occupied maybe 60, 69 years. At Chaco and sites up here in the Mesa Verde region, um, in this time period, if you find obsidian, it's mostly as finished tools. But at Aztec North, it was mostly waste material, um, or, you know, the waste material left over when you make tools, or it was just informal tools. And they actually napped it and used it in ways that look very much the same as local materials. Uh, which leads us to believe that they're actually not trying to conserve the obsidian. It's not something that's precious that they can't get their hands on. Uh, it's actually something that they have access to. So it has kind of uh, led to the conclusion that Aztec North has some kind of relationship to Jemez that other places do not have. Uh, I'm thinking through what that is. Is it kinship? Is it trade? I'm actually working on a paper with Kellen Throgmorton, who did the lithic analysis uh, for my Aztec North samples. Uh, we're gonna, gonna write that up. Okay, the next research question is daily life and subsistence. I'm gonna go fast because I see that I'm taking more time than I meant to. Um, again, it was a small dig, so there's a limit to how much I can tell you, but we had beads. We had these beautiful little black shale beads, um, very similar to beads at Aztec West. The faunal, uh, the animal bones, um, we had two little tools, both of them there. One of them is an, a little awl or maybe a needle, and the other one is an antler tip that maybe was used for uh, tool making. It was 30% rabbits, 31% artiodactyls, which includes deer and elk and other similar animals. Um, the other 30% was mostly rodents and small birds. Those proportions are really similar to other great house sites like Solomon Pueblo and Pueblo Alto. So again, suggesting the, the fact that this, this is a Chaco great house. Um, on the other hand, we didn't find any carnivores, no bears or birds of prey, uh, which are often found at Chaco sites. We had three turkey bones, so I can tell you there were turkeys there, but I can't really tell you anything about what they did with them. We also had some fish. Um, Archaeologists have sort of long thought that Pueblo people, ancestral Pueblo people, didn't eat fish. And that's partly because we didn't find a lot of those their bones, but also um, some of the modern Pueblos have taboos against eating fish. And people had thought that maybe that was true in the past as well. Uh, we found fish. They were near a hearth. Uh, these are vertebrae from a fish. I can't, we, 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 it can't be identified to species based on just the vertebrae, unfortunately. But Again, I don't think that people were eating tons of fish. It probably wasn't their favorite food. But as I've sort of started talking to people about fish, uh, it seems like fish have been found at a lot of different sites. Um, 
in small quantities. So maybe it's maybe it's what you eat when you don't have anything else, or maybe it's something you eat on special occasions. All right, uh, archaeobotanical analysis, the study of seeds. I'll just go through this real quick. We have maize, of course, that is the, the, the big food, plant food for them. But we had lots of other species, uh, yeah, things you might think of as food, prickly pear. Um, yucca was used for a lot of things. Um, ground cherry, purslane, juniper. Uh, So the, the bulrush and reed I have in blue because these are both uh, things that are coming up from the river. So, yeah, uh, riparian species. We had some wood, mountain mahogany and pinion. There were a few other kinds of wood, but there was no ponderosa pine, which is interesting. The other thing we had a lot of is kinoams. So that's kinopodium and amaranth. We can't always tell them apart. Um, so these are these are tiny little seeds that pack a nutritional punch. So these are really good food. They're, they're similar to quinoa from South America. Um, so highly nutritious foods and people relied a lot on them. And one exciting thing that we actually found was domesticated amaranth. Um, so amaranth is one of the ancient grains and again, similar to quinoa in that it's, it's super nutritious. And archeologically, it's really hard to tell domesticated amaranth from wild amaranth but we have domesticated amaranth at Aztec North. So I'm actually working on publishing that with Karen Adams because that's kind of an exciting, exciting find. Okay, very quickly, we had one little perishable. For those of you who've been to Aztec West, you know there are amazing uh, perishable artifacts that were taken out of that great house. Uh, at Aztec North, we don't have the same kind of preservation, but uh, we had this little thing. Lori looked at it and she thinks it's yucca. Um, and she suggested that it's probably something architectural, a little square knot. They used twine and, and yucca fiber to hold together beams. This is an, a ladder where the rung is being held in place by a yucca a twine. Uh, ochre, uh, I just wanted to mention this because I, I, I'm thinking about pigments and color a lot, but I, I love that artifact on the upper right. It's actually a little palette where it seems like they heated ochre. If you heat ochre, it, it becomes darker. So you can see the yellow in the center, the orange around it, and then the charring. So I think they were actually trying to make their ochre darker there. Um, this has nothing to do with any of the research questions, but I think it's a fun story. You know, we found these two pencils that were pretty well buried. I think they were like 10 centimeters deep. Uh, and of course the crew members found them and immediately started saying, oh, we found Earl Morris's pencils. So I did a little research and those vertical striations you can see on the left uh, on, on the ferrule, on the metal piece of the pencil, that was a really important development in pencil manufacturing. It made it stronger and made it possible to uh, use cheaper metals. Um, and that was pat patented in 1964 and Earl Morris died in the 50s. So these were not Earl Morris's pencils, but possibly by another archeologist like Pete McKenna or John Stein who surveyed the site. All right, conclusion slide. So this was constructed sometime before Aztec West, I think, sometime between 1070 and 1110. I think it was built by people who had not built a great house before, but they did have some Chacoan knowledge. I think that it was a moment of transition. These people are trying to become part of the Chaco system. And, and there's this sort of transition from their more egalitarian adobe building ways to building on the Chacoan scale and, and on the Chacoan model with, with the stone. But the artifacts are mostly very typical of a great house. So I think that that switch over happened pretty quickly. The obsidian is not typical for this place in this time. Uh, I think there were, there's something different going on there that we need to explore more. And I always want to just mention again, that connection to the river to to this wet place with the fish, with the plants, the use of adobe, which made it very different from Jocko and other sites. So I just wanna say thank you to, to all the people who helped me with this. And I tried to give shout outs in here, but if I missed anyone, I apologize, but this was not just my work. It was a whole team of people and also the folks at Aztec who, who made this possible at all. And also my, uh, my funders that are listed there. So that's what I've got.
and I am happy to take any questions. That was fantastic, Michelle. Thank you so much for that presentation. We have um, a lot of questions. People oh, have been okay. asking great questions on both Facebook and on Zoom. Um, and I want to start with sort of a, a basic one. A lot of people were really interested in all of the different chakra and attributes. And we had one person ask whether there was any evidence for a great Kiva at Aztec North. Did you find any evidence for, for one? So that wasn't really part of my research, but uh, John Stein and Pete McKenna, yes, there is there is a large kiva there, um, and there are other great kivas around the terrace. I should have actually mentioned that there's all kinds of things on the terrace. There are small houses, there are some isolated great kivas. Um, you know, I, I we didn't excavate in a kiva. I, I can't tell you a lot more than than what John Stein and Pete McKenna published, but yes, yes, awesome. We had a lot of people ask about core and veneer um, architecture, and um, and we just got a couple of really interesting questions. One question was, um, is it possible that the veneer itself was actually removed during the construction of Aztec West and Aztec East from Aztec North? Or di did you find um, a different type of veneer on those walls? Um. Okay, so the vin you know, the tiny little bit of veneer that was there, um, mm -hmm. it looks very similar to veneer at some parts of Aztec West. Uh, I should have mentioned again that the veneer at Aztec North is actually a really crumbly sandstone. It actually fell apart in our screens a lot. So I think that's why we're not seeing it on the surface. Um, and I should have also mentioned that we actually found like veneer collapsed. So I actually, that's why I think it was the whole, the whole walls actually were veneered. Whether they were robbing Aztec North to build Aztec West, good question. I, it's possible. It's also possible that some of that early, early wood at Aztec West might have been stolen from Aztec North. Um, but I think the overall cultural landscape suggests that Aztec North continues to be important even when something better gets built down below. So um, yeah, it's possible. Somebody, David Wharton mentioned, um, he noticed in your map the shift from at Chaco, a north-south orientation um, with Pueblo Alto and then um, Benito to the south. Um, but then at Aztec, at the Aztec complex, you get sort of a shift um, northeast south or northwest southeast is do you find any significance in that or what do you think is going on there and is that a broader pattern in yeah so there's a lot to talk about there um so the north south we call that the cardinal alignment um okay. that is the prevailing alignment at chaco uh in this time period um the solstitial at aztec uh is different and Steve Lexon has actually argued that there was some kind of factional fight going on and um, the solstitial faction won at Aztec while, while the Cardinal won at uh, Chaco. Um, Aztec is due north mm -hmm. and I don't know if I don't want to try to find the slide but Aztec north itself is pretty cardinal and it's when Aztec west is built that it all shifts. shifts. Hmm. So I think that I've identified, I may have identified when that happened. Sometime between 1070 and 1110 is when that, that factional fight got fought. So, oh. yeah. Oh, that's neat. <laughs> um, did you find any, uh, Charlie asked, did you find any uh, cylinder jars? <laughs> uh, no, that would have been really cool. But no, it's actually really hard to tell from just sherds. Unless mm -hmm. you have, to have that exact shirt at the base, it's really hard to tell what you've got. Um, no, and um, our shirts were all jars or bowls. I think maybe we had a, a one thing that I thought might be a pitcher, but no. Got it. Um, several people asked about the surrounding community. Are there small houses in the region that maybe would have been built or used during the time just before the building of? Aztec North and of the um, of the other Aztec great houses. So in the Aztec, in the uh, Animus Valley, a little bit away from Aztec, there's some uh, 
one communities. Um, but there's nothing at Aztec, especially that's that's right before um, the great house. There are houses around on the terrace top. And I, uh, for my master's thesis, actually analyzed pottery from a few of those. And Lori Reed has done most oh. of them. And they seem to be very much contemporaneous with okay. Aztec North. So those are the people who are building Aztec North. That's, that's where they're living. Um, did you recommend, so you did these test, test excavations. You've written up your report. You reported back to Aztec Ruins National Monument. Have you recommended any further exploration of, um, of that site to answer different questions? Were there new questions for you that you feel like excavation would be warranted in answering? Hmm. Um, so I guess I should say that getting the opportunity to excavate at a national park um, is incredibly rare. Mm -hmm. um, at, at a great house in a national park. So I feel very, very lucky to have been able to do what we did. I'm not asking for more right now. And there are good reasons not to excavate, right? And if descending communities uh, oppose excavation, um, we should listen to that. Um, you know, we answered a lot of questions. I have more questions. You know, you asked about the Kiva. I, I don't have a good handle on, on Kivas at Asia. Yeah. Uh, road. I have questions about that. That site, that gateway site on, on the road going up, I'd like to know more about that. But I would also like to point out that there are piles and piles of artifacts from the Southwest sitting in museums around the country, including at the AMNH. And I've looked at some of them and I want to do more of that. Um, you know, we should we should first study the things that we've already removed from the ground before we do yeah. more. And there's a lot we can do from the surface as well. Agreed. Well, Michelle, thank you so much for um, for this presentation and for spending the time with us. Thanks to all of you who joined us um, for Michelle's talk. Uh, hope to see you next week for Sarah Ois's talk on maize in the Southwest. And um, and again, thank you. Yeah, have a happy weekend. Thanks, Kyle. Bye. Thanks.